interesting. <laughs> Too much TV. All right. Let's turn to Acts chapter 15. A couple of weeks ago, Jacob was telling us and, and, uh, about the itineraries of Paul, and we, we, before that, we looked at the conversion of the apostle Paul. And uh, just to remind you of, of this part about his conversion, that when he was blind, remember he was alone for three days and he was waiting, and God said to Ananias, I want you to go to my servant Paul, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, and I am going to send him to do this and do that and to the Gentiles, and he is going to suffer many things for me. So it is very abundantly clear from the beginning that the Apostle Paul is called by Jesus Christ and given a very specific ministry to carry out. In this first uh, itinerary, first, uh, Paul's first journey, uh, you see it here, it's up here on the board. Hey, I got this pen, I could go like this. <laughs> so he started in Antioch, and then from Antioch he went over to the island of, of Cyprus, and in Cyprus is where he runs into this one guy, and I remember uh, the, the uh, Elemist, the sorcerer, comes up against him, and then Paul does, you know, prays, and the guy goes blind, and it's just a tremendous, God is working with him. Paul isn't, Paul isn't flying free here on his own. He's being led by Jesus to do everything that he's doing. He is carrying out the will of God as Jesus is leading him. So he goes through the island, then they come across the Mediterranean Sea, and they go up here to Perga, and in Perga he holds forth the word of God, then from Perga to Panphalia, then from Panphalia up here to Antioch. There's two Antiochs. You see this one over here, and then there's one over here. This is where, I, where this all is, is what we now call Turkey. And in all of these places, he's reaching out to Jews and Gentiles, which was what Jesus called them to do, which was revolutionary. It was different. It had not been done before the Apostle Paul. When you look at the book of Acts, you see that the, the first number of chapters, the first half of the book of Acts, is about Peter and John, and they're moving the gospel among the Jews, among the Israelites. It's basically not the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul comes on the scene in chapter 13, and, and now this is what we're looking at here is in Acts 14 and Acts, leading into Acts 15. He is going into Gentile areas, reaching out and touching and, and winning Gentiles. And he's doing it in a supernatural way, so it's incontroversial that, that he is, that this is God's doing. This isn't Paul's doing. He goes here from Antioch, then he goes down to Iconium, then from Iconium to Lystra, and then from Lystra to Derby. Isn't it in Derby where he gets stoned to death? I, I, they, they, they get so upset with him, or is it in Lystra, or Lyconia? One of those two, I think it was Lyconia. I forget, I should have looked. One of those cities, doesn't matter. He got stoned. They took him out and they stoned him. And then they, they ministered healing to him. The next day he went back in and preached the gospel again. Supernatural. Miracles all over the place. It's undeniable that Christ is working with him. And then from Derby, he works his way back down to Pamph uh, Pamphylia, and then back down to Perga, and then back across over here to Antioch, which is his home area. That's his first itinerary. He gets back, to, back to, to Antioch, and in chapter 15 of the book of Acts, some men came down from Judah and began teaching the brethren at Antioch. It says they came down from Judah, and the reason it says that is uh, we're talking basically from Jerusalem. Jerusalem, they always refer to it coming down from Jerusalem, no matter where you're going, whether it's north, south, east, or west. Uh, they, so some of the men came down from Judah and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas heard this dissension and debate, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders concerning this issue. Now again, as this map has illustrated, he has already gone to city after city after city. We're talking about months and months and months of success of reaching the Gentiles. Now the Jews are coming up to Antioch and saying, oh, no, 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 you've got to be circumcised or you can't be saved. Well, Paul experientially knows that's not true because none of these people were required to get circumcised. Circumcision had nothing at all to do with it. 
It had everything to do with them except in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, believing that God raised him from the dead, and, you know, becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. It had nothing to do with circumcision. So when these guys came from Judah, this is what they believed in Judah. They believed that you still needed to carry out the Mosaic law. And that's what they were trying to put on the Gentiles. Paul says, hey, no, 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 no. Paul and Barnabas both know by experience, not intellectually, they experienced it. You know, you see somebody, you see somebody speak in tongues. You talk to them about God and you see them speak in tongues. You know something's happened here. You see somebody that's, that's, that, that's blind or somebody that's hindering you from speaking the word and then you reach out to the guy and the guy accepts Christ. I mean, this is undeniable stuff. So they were wrong in this. So now we're going to go to Jerusalem and have what is referred to as the first church council meeting in the first century. And there's many church council meetings that happen after this for into the second century. At this, first, at this first meeting here, again, Paul and Barnabas go to it, all the elders seem to be gathered and the apostles. And, and what becomes apparent is James, the Lord's brother, uh, who wasn't uh, one of the original apostles, he, he just happens to have the same name as the, another James, he, he is, for one reason or another, he has risen to the position of responsibility where he's the leader of the church that's in Israel. And uh, it may very well be because he's the one that wrote the book of James. And the book of James is believed to be among the first that was written, if not the first that was written after Jesus ascended into heaven. So he rose to prominence from the fact that he had the book of James. But when you read the book of James, which, you know, you guys, we went through the book of James. When you look at that, you read through the book of James, it's very apparent that this man did not know what Paul knew. Paul's writings came later, and Paul speaks about things that James does not speak about because James did not know this information. James, the book of James is basically a recapitulation of the Sermon on the Mount. That's basically what it is. He's teaching what Jesus taught him. Well, Jesus taught before he was crucified and before he ascended. That's what James is teaching. Now he is, he is ascended, and time has gone by. Years have gone by. And no one has been really receptive until the Apostle Paul to what Jesus really accomplished on the cross. And that's what the writings of Paul are about. So Paul is going to Jerusalem. James is in charge. The other apostles are there. Peter's there. And now they're going to debate whether or not it's important for the Gentiles to be circumcised in order to be saved. You already know, because I just told you, that that isn't a requirement. way by the church. They pass through Phoenicia and Samaria and they tell them about the Gentiles. There's great joy among the brethren. Verse 4, when they arrived at Jerusalem, they, re they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had, be who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. These Pharisees are people who have accepted the Lordship of Christ. They're a part of the family. And you know, as I've, I've shared this recently, that the Pharisees, their whole beginning thing was the, perse the perseverance of the Scripture. And, and you know, they, they were the vanguards of the Scripture. And it was there, they said, look, these guys, these Gentiles, if they're going to be a part of the family of God, they got to get circumcised and they got to keep the Mosaic law. Not true. Not true at all. Because we already know from this itinerary that all these guys have accepted Christ and are a part of the family. So the apostles and the elders began to verse 6. They came together, they look into this matter. And there had been much debate. Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that early in the days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He's referring back to what transpired in Acts chapter 10, also referred to in Acts chapter 11, where Peter went to the household of Cornelius. Again, very obviously God directed. You know, Peter saw the vision, Cornelius, you know, and, and the whole thing that transpired. And these guys spoke in tongues. Undeniable 
proof that they had the Holy Spirit. You can't do that unless you have the Holy Spirit. And they, Peter's saying, they're Gentiles. And I didn't circumcise them. And I didn't tell them to keep the law of Moses. So that's the point here. Verse 9, And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you put why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through what? The grace of our Lord Jesus. And in the same way as they also are. And the people kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. I mean, this is the way you're supposed to carry out business. You got, you got divisions and schisms. You bring everybody together and you talk about it. And you now you got Peter, who is obviously, he was the spiritual leader that Jesus appointed. He was supposed to be the one in charge, not so much James. And, and Peter is saying, look, the Gentiles have believed and they don't need to keep the law. And then, then we've got this extraordinary testimony of Paul and Barnabas and all the miracles that they've seen, all the people that have believed. It's kind of in, there's no debate here. And you know, that you don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to fulfill the Mosaic law. But the, the issue is, they did not know this yet. They did not know it. We look back and we understand it because we've read the writings of Paul. But the writings of Paul were not written yet. Paul is brand new. He's just getting started as compared, this is like 15 years into the first century. I mean, this is a long time going. So they have been reaching out to the Jews, reaching out to the Jews. Paul's the first one, uh, Peter, that one incident. But Peter never went back to the Gentiles. He continued to go to the Jews. He, even though God did this to Peter, he still was primarily ministering to the Jews. You had some, you know, few Gentiles here and there. But now we see with Paul really the plan of God. The plan of God all along was that it would reach out to the whole world and not just to Israel. And, and that it wasn't a requirement to carry out the law or to be circumcised. These people in Israel still did not know this. Paul is the one that received this revelation. They are embracing the I mean, Peter and James and all these guys. They're still keeping the Mosaic law. They're in Jerusalem. They're going to the temple. They're involved in the weekly Sabbaths. They're involved in the animal sacrifices and all the rest. All that goes along with Judaism, they're still practicing because they don't know any different at this point. Paul is the one that's going to bring you the information. And now look at verse, verse 13. After they had stopped speaking, that is Paul and Barnabas, James answered saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. For the words of the prophet agree, just as it is written, after these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which was fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, say, says the, the Lord, says Yahweh, who makes these. It was very good. What he did was he went to a Bible and, you know, he went back to the Old Testament and he put together what was going on. But it's, I, I always, you know, you got to read this carefully. He didn't make, he, make, he made reference to Peter. He said, you, you heard what Simon said. He didn't say you heard what Paul and Barnabas said. It wasn't important to him as, as the fact that this is what Simon said. And because Simon said it, we're going to believe it. Not necessarily because Paul and Barnabas said it. Because what happens as a result of this meeting? They write a thing out. They give it to Paul. They send Paul back to the Gentiles. And they want to tell the Gentiles, you are indeed accepted. You don't need to be circumcised. And you don't need to carry out the, the Mosaic law. But they did not change their thinking that they, as the Israelites, the called, the original call, they still thought it was a requirement for them to be circumcised and for them to carry out the law. Paul leaves. He knows this is not true, as does Barnabas. He leaves. He goes on his way back out to the Gentiles, and he's going he's to tell them this. He's got a, an epistle from James and the others that were there. But meantime, in Israel, they're still, they're still embraced and embroidered in the Old Covenant. And they don't, they don't regard Paul with the same esteem as they do Peter. Not at all. Look at Galatians chapter 2. 
The reason I'm taking the time to explain this to you, it's this information that helps you to understand all of the writings of Paul. This is very fundamental and very important if you're going to understand why Paul wrote the way he wrote in Romans and Galatians in Ephesians and Hebrews. And well, really, all of the epistles of Paul address this one way or another. Some of them more so than others. The book of Romans in particular and Galatians and Hebrews really focuses on the, the conflict that was existing in the first century church. One more time, the conflict is this that the people of the, of the Israel background, under the tutelage and leadership of James, who was the head of the church, was teaching people and expecting people to continue on carrying out the Old Covenant. The fact of the matter is, the Old Covenant ended on the day of Pentecost. No, it ended on the cross. When, that, when the blood of Christ was spilt, that was the end of the Old Covenant and the beginning of the New Covenant. And in the, so, so now we've got this problem because the Israelites, and, and this problem continues on throughout the first century church. That's why Paul writes the way he writes in these epistles, is to rectify this error, which was never, it ends up being the demise of the first century church. It ends up being that the Christian Jews, the, the, the Christians of Israel background, end up persecuting Paul and the followers of Paul. They go behind Paul. He's going into these places to teach the word, to reach the Gentiles, and the Jews are coming behind them and saying, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to carry out the law. And, of course, it wasn't true. And it ends up being a real division, and a lot of the people turn away. It wasn't, you know, Paul's persecuted by two groups of people. He's persecuted by Christ, and then he's persecuted by the Jews who do believe in Christ but don't embrace the doctrine that Paul is teaching. It was hard for him. Paul wasn't a one, he wasn't a one of the uh, original apostles. He wasn't, he wasn't with Jesus. He came much later. You know, why would he be given this information and we wouldn't be given this information? I'm sure that's kind of the head they had, which was stupid. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, after, <clears throat> after an interval of 14 years, Paul speaks, and I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. That's what we just read in Acts 15. Taking Titus along with us, and it was because of a revelation that I went up. I, in other words, he didn't go because of it. Jesus told him to go. By revelation that I went up. And I submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. But I did so in privately to those who are of reputation. For I feared that I might be running or had run in vain. You know, I, 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 in private, I met with James, I met with Peter, I met with John, the elders of the church, and I told them what, what I was teaching. I told them what Jesus was having me to teach was, was different than what they were teaching. And I didn't want to be in error, I told it to them. But now, verse, thir verse 3, but not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, that means he was a Gentile, was compelled to be circumcised. They didn't compel Titus to be circumcised. They accepted what he was saying. But it was because of false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. For from those who were of high reputation, what, the, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. High reputation, again, Peter, John, James, the apostles. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. They didn't argue with me. They said, okay. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to, on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to Peter had been to the circumcision, so he, was, he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcision effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcision. We're going to continue to go to the Jews. You go to the Gentiles. They also asked us to remember the poor, 
the very thing I also was eager to do. That was also explained in chapter 15, but I didn't read it to save time. And when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, so after you got the church council meeting, the meeting is over, it's decided that Paul and Barnabas would go back up to Antioch. This is, they were down here, and Jerusalem is down here. They went back up to Antioch. That would be Paul and Barnabas and Silas went with them, and a number of other brethren went up there. And now they're telling the Gentiles they don't need to be circumcised. They're teaching the gospel. After a period of time, Peter also comes up from Jerusalem. This is after the meeting. Peter comes up. He wants to check out what's going on. So, verse 11, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he saw the coming of certain men from James. He used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. And then the rest of the Jews joined in his hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. I think the King James says the dissimulation, which means hypocrisy. What happened was Peter came up and he's hanging around with the Gentiles. He says, oh, this is wonderful. Everybody's believing we're all family and all the rest. And then somebody came from James and James had apparently such a powerful influence over what was going on. Peter, Peter, Peter of all men, this courageous man. I mean, it's just hard for me to believe Peter would be this way. Remember, he's the one that cut off the guy's ear when they were trying to take Jesus. Peter's the one that jumped out of the boat and walked on water. Peter's always that one that had that courage. But he, was, he cowered with the thought of James. He was afraid of being thrown out of the church. He was afraid of being blackballed. I can relate to that. I mean, he, he, had, he, was, he was intimidated by James and the brethren coming from Jerusalem, so much so that he withdrew himself from the Gentiles and wouldn't fellowship with them anymore. Because they're not circumcised, they're not keeping the law. I have to separate myself, I'm a pure Israelite. And all the other Jews that were in, that, in Antioch sided with Peter. Even Barnabas, who had been with Paul on this itinerary that we just looked at and had seen all this. So tell me, how heavy was the influence of James? And herein is the schism that dogs the first century church all the way to its demise into the second century. And... Um, so Paul confronts Peter. Now, the, the, the wonderful thing about this is that when you read First and Second Peter, especially Second Peter, you understand that Peter accepted this reproof and changed and encouraged people in the writing of the epistle of Peter, read the writings of Paul. They might be difficult to read, but read them. They're the right thing. James, it never indicates that he changed his way of thinking. He may have, I don't know. Verse 13, the rest of the Jews joined in verse 14. But when I, saw, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of them all, confronted them in front of everybody, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by what? The works of the law but through faith in Christ Jesus. We have believed in Christ Jesus so, even that we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. But if we, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves also become found sinners and so on. So Paul lays it out, confronts Peter, and, uh, you know, again, what a wonderful individual, what a candidate to do this. The Apostle Paul, here's a guy that knew carrying out the law didn't make you justified. Carrying out the law made him a murderer. You know, and it was the reason that how he got justified, he ran into Jesus. And it was a matter of humility and, you know, and, and grace and mercy and forgiveness and all these other things. You know the record. Look at uh, Galatians chapter 3. Again, this is so vital to understand what I'm communicating if you're going to understand Romans and Galatians and Hebrews and Ephesians. In Romans chapter 3, verse 15, Brethren, I speak in terms of human revelation. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, 
No one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. I am saying this, the law, which came 430 years later, 430 years after Abraham, does not invalidate the covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. The law did not change the covenant that God made with Abraham. It all started with Abraham. And you know what Abraham was? He was a Gentile. There were no Jews yet. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. The, the Israelites came out of Abraham, who himself was a Gentile. So the whole premise of this special anointing to Israel and the exclusion of the Gentiles was never the plan of God. Of course, it was hidden, and people didn't understand this. Verse 18, For if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So why the law then? What's the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Verse 20. Now a mediator is not of one, whereas God is one. The law then, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? No, may it never be. For the, if the law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But the scriptures, the law was never intended to make people righteous. The law was never intended to make people justified. The law was never intended to bring salvation to people. The law, the intention of the law was to bring people to the place of coming to Christ. Then it was the available. Your battery is running low. Hmm. Well, maybe your battery's running low. It, the promise was to Abraham. You see that chart? There's 430 years before the Mosaic Law, and then from the Mosaic Law to Jesus, there's like maybe, I'm not sure about the number here, but 16, 1,680 years. The law, the purpose of the law was to hold people in until Christ came. That was the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was... You, if, if, if Christ never came, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of the descendants of, of Israel, none of them would be saved. Salvation is through the cross of Christ. If Christ never came, if the cross never happened, all those people in the Old Testament would have died and stayed dead. There would have been no salvation. It's all based on the cross. Of course, that's a hypothetical that didn't happen. Verse 21 again, if the, is the law contrary? Verse 22, but the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by the faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, before Jesus came and all that was available, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore the law has become our... See that there? You with me? Verse 24. The law has become our what? Tutor. And to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. Look in your notes uh, in verse, I have it at verse 25. It really, sh verse 25 says, For, but now the faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. The word tutor is this Greek word I have written out here that Sean can tell you how to say later on. It's the English word pedagogue. A pedagogue in both, in, it's not a term that we, we use a lot. We would use the word tutor, but a pedagogue was more than just a tutor. In both the Greek and the Roman culture, it was common for a slave escort or a hired tutor to, ser to serve as a guardian of a person, legally incapable of managing his or her own affairs, especially a child under the age of puberty. They, the pedagogue, taught the child, they disciplined the child, they guided the child, they protected the child until the child was old enough to care for himself. This is exactly what the law did until Christ came. Once Christ came, the time of maturity was reached, the pedagogue, the law, was no longer needed. So the law, 
you know, guided and taught and worked with people until Christ came. Once Christ came, there's no longer any need for the pedagogue. There's no longer any need for the law. Does that make sense? Verse 25, verse 26, For you are all the sons of God through faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. It's through faith in Christ Jesus, not through the law. For all who ha were baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Therefore, it's neither Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free man, neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Where you're, where you're from what your gender is, what your race is, what, it has nothing to do with anything. Everything has to do with what happened for us on the cross in the presence of Christ. Like I taught last Sunday, He was our substitute, and we identify with Him. When He died, we died. When He got up, we got up. When He ascended, we ascended, and so on. You know, that we have that connection with Christ. That's how salvation comes. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're an Israelite or you're a Jew, whether you keep the law or you don't keep the law. If you, be, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. Now chapter 4 says, Now I say, as long as an heir is a child, as long as an heir is a child, he does not differ at all from the slave, although he is an owner of everything. But he is under guardians and management until the day set by his father. So also we, he's using this as a comparison, so also we, while we were children, we were held in bondage under the elementary things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sonship. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you are an heir through God. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, analogy, if you can grab hold of it. He's saying, you know, a kid is, you know, he may be the heir of everything, but until he is mature enough to take the responsibility, he's just like a slave. He has nothing. But once he reaches maturity, then he can receive the blessings of the inheritance. And he's saying humanity was like that child. And now that Christ has come, the fullness of Christ has come, now we are able to accept that salvation that's available through Christ, that justification. Look at Colossians chapter 2, please. Colossians 2. Verse 16. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect of festival or new moon or Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. In your notes, I wrote the following next to Colossians 2, 16 through 18. The phrase, what you eat, is referring to the kosher laws that are in the Mosaic law. The festival, the new moon, the Sabbath days are referring to the annual feasts that they had, like Passover uh, and so on, the annual feasts, the monthly celebrations, and then the weekly Sabbaths. These things were and are a shadow. A shadow when you have a shadow, you get to see the outline. You see my hand is the shadow. You don't see the detail of my hand if you're just looking at the shadow. Can you see the shadow? You see the shadow of me? That's not me. It gives you an idea. It gives you an understanding. It gives you a, a slight impression of what's to come. Well, that's what the law was. Everything in the law was a shadow of things to come. The law was our pedagogue until Christ. The law taught us Many things. We go back now and we see, oh, that's what this, was, this is what the temple was all about. Why the temple was important. This is what the mercy seat was about. Oh, that's what the high priest was about. Oh, that's what the animal sacrifices were. Oh, that's what Passover was all about. Oh, that's what the Feast of Tabernacles. It all was a type, a shadowy type. 
In other words, they couldn't see it clearly. They could see there was something there. Something was coming, but they couldn't see it clearly until Christ came, until Christ told Paul, and then Paul's telling us. You see, all of those things, all of, if, if, you, if you had any spiritual perception and understanding like men like David had, you, you saw through this, you know, the Lord is really saying to me, the only way I can be saved is by God's grace. This is impossible for me to do. The only way I can, the, the sacrifices that were offered, they were only a temporary th- fix. You know, the, the, when they, when the Day of Atonement was only a year long. You had to go back year after year after year. And if, if you were really in tune with what the Lord, but they weren't. They weren't in tune with it when it was written, when they were living under it. They weren't in tune with it even with when Jesus was there. The apostles that didn't understand, they still thought you had to keep the law in order to be justified. They didn't understand the whole point of the law. That was never the point of the law. The point of the law was to be, bring people to the place of Christ and understanding that we need Christ to be saved and to be justified. Romans chapter 7, it says, again, just in your notes, uh, what shall we say then? Sean, you, be, you probably better plug this in because it, it just went out and you're not going to have battery power. You, you want to do that now? In Romans chapter 7, what shall we say then? Is, is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not cover it. One of the things that the law did for us was it showed us what sin was. Paul says, I, I, you know, I suffered the consequences of covetousness, but I didn't know it was wrong. The law told him it was wrong. And that's you know, one of the great benefits of the law. In chapter 7 of Romans, again in your notes, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The law is holy. There's, there's nothing wrong with the law. It was holy it was righteous and good. Verse 14, 714. For we know that the law is spiritual. Hebrews 8, verse 13. When he said a new covenant, he made the first obsolete. But whatever is coming, becoming obsolete, is growing old, is ready to disappear. The old covenant, which we know to be the Mosaic covenant, Jews today do not refer to it as the Old Covenant. They refer to it as the Covenant. It's not an Old Covenant to them. It's an Old Covenant to us because we've been given a New Covenant. The New Covenant came with Christ on the cross. The blood that was spilled on the cross was the ratifying of a New Covenant. A New Covenant that provides eternal life, justification, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, salvation through the blood of Christ. The old covenant didn't do that. You see, and so, so we refer to the old as the old. I mean, we refer to the Mosaic as the old and what Jesus brought as the new covenant. Uh, your Bibles really are not situated right. They have the, you know, they say the beginning of the Old Testament and then they have the beginning of the New Testament, new covenant, old covenant, new covenant. It's, it, to some degree it's right, but it's not perfectly clear. That probably what I just said there didn't make anything else clear either. Uh, again in your notes, much of what Paul teaches in Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, and Hebrews deals with the wrong understanding of the Old Covenant plus ignorance of the New Covenant. He forcefully and often proves no one is saved by the law. Many today, you get what I'm, you, I mean, I've, I've just, I've spent an, almost 40 minutes here ex- trying to explain this, that what Paul is refudiating is that the, we don't live under the law anymore. And that's not the way for justification. You got that? Okay, what has happened is many people today have read the writings of Paul and have concluded that works, all works, are wrong. And instead of getting the point that Paul is making, he's not talking about works in general. He's talking very specifically about the old covenant and the new covenant. And that they were believing that you had to fulfill the Mosaic law. And he's refuting that. He's not refuting the fact that you're supposed to have works. That's not true. Uh, Again, in my notes, I wrote it out here. The Old Covenant 
plus ignorance of the new covenant, he forcefully and often proves no one is saved by the law. Many today misunderstand this teaching, thinking Paul is condemning faith works. The wrong teaching has invoked the idea that we are saved by grace and not by works, so all works are wrong. And that's just absolutely incorrect. And we go to Ephesians chapter 2, and we read, Even you who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all had our life in time past, in the lust of the flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, being rich in his mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And raised us up together with Christ, and made us sit together with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. So that in the age to come, that he might show the riches and the greatness of his kindness towards us, and, and uh, for by grace you are saved, not of yourselves, it is a, not of works, lest, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we, we take that and we say, you see, works are not required. Well, the fact of the matter is, works don't save you, the law don't save you, nothing that any human can do or all the humans can do, none of that will justify anybody, no one can be saved by anything that we do. It had to be done for us in Jesus. He is the sacrifice that he had to die. He had to do what he did and accomplish what he accomplished in order for anyone to have any benefit from it. But that does not nullify the fact that faith is required to receive the benefit of, of the new birth. Because we can't deny what it says so absolutely plainly, ironically, well, it would make sense that it would be in the book of James. <laughs> because James is the one that puts together faith and works. He says, what good does it do, brethren, if someone comes to you and they're hungry and they have no clothes and you give them righteous platitudes, but you don't give them any food or any clothes? What good does that do them? That's the same as faith without works. Or you think you're hot stuff because you think that there's only one God? Well, demons even do that. I mean, you're not that smart because you have... You're not, but again, faith without works is dead. The point is, because you have an intellectual understanding that Jesus Christ is Lord, because you have an intellectual understanding that God raised him from the dead, that doesn't mean that you have faith. That means you have understanding. Faith is you're obedient to what Jesus says to do. He goes on to say, I mean, how can you not understand this illustration? As a body without breath is dead... So is faith without works is dead. The works that we're supposed to have in our life is founded upon the faith that we have that Jesus is our Lord. If Jesus is your Lord, then you do what Jesus says to do. And this is not a hard concept. If he's your Lord, you, he lords over you. He tells you what to do. You're the whore. You're the... I forget, the, how's that phrase go? Yes, you're the horse and he's the boss. <laughs> so, uh, you could read Romans 3, 4, 5, and it will explain in much more detail everything I just said. Again, the, the reason for the, so much of the reason for the writing of Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews in particular plus it's touched upon in Ephesians and Colossians and really all of the writings of Paul, but those three, this is what is being communicated, and this is what is you know, so vital to our understanding if we're going to understand the writings of Paul. And uh, we want to understand the writings of Paul, but don't misunderstand the writings of Paul. Don't read into it what the current uh, trend is being pushed in the world today. I mean, it, it is... Uh,